Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Underwater Photography Show. As always, I'm Matthew Sullivan. And I'm Alex Mustard. And in this episode of the show, we're challenging ourselves to try something new and different. Um, we've always been really keen since we started the show to try and get more voices into the underwater photography show. And to be honest, we've been hobbled by the technology in that we haven't been quite sure how to split this screen into three using the recording software we're doing. So today we've invited a photographer that both of us think incredibly highly about onto the show. Um, but we're going to transition into a Zoom call to speak to him. Um, and that that we know at least then we'll get good audio and good video and we'll be able to speak to him. And he'll also be able to share his pictures with us and talk to us about his photos. So, Matt, tell us who we've got coming on the show. So today we are welcoming Shane Gross to the Underwater Photography Show. Uh, most people watching this probably know his name, at least if they don't know him personally. Uh, his images have been awarded in everything. They've been published everywhere, um, A, for their uniqueness, and B, because his skill level uh, underwater is really, really high. Um, he's and also he's a very thoughtful photographer. Sorry, I'm, you know, you know, he's, no, you know, yeah, sure. he always seems to, you know, he's created a huge number of really unique images and they're yeah. always images that have got a, a lot of thought behind them, a lot of process. Um, and therefore I think they, they live long very well. You can go back to his shots five years later and you still get an impact from them. Yeah. And he's very, uh, conscious with regards to his images translating into some sort of conservation, um, projects or awareness or uses. And that's why we have him on today actually is to talk about the brand new Seahorse National Park in the Bahamas, which Shane was uh, a huge part. Mm. Yes, that's the word I was looking for, thank you. It was instrumental in getting done, um, thanks in part to his photography. Uh, so with that, we would like to welcome Shane to the show. Hey Shane, how you doing? Great, uh, thanks so much for having me here. It's a real honor, I'm a, I'm a big fan of both of yours and of the show, so I, I really appreciate this. That's the correct we answer. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time to come on with us. Um, and we're going to get into the reason we had you on in a little bit. But uh, first, have you been up to anything cool shooting in your local waters, anything like that? Yeah, so I'm based on Vancouver Island in, in Nanaimo, a city called Nanaimo in Vancouver Island. So I've been doing this is a great time of year to be here because the water's actually clear. It's the clearest it is because there's not a lot of sun. It's a lot of rain. It's cold, but the water's nice and clear. And we've had a lot of critters out lately. Uh, I know, Matt, you're one of your favorite fish is the spiny lump sucker. I've been seeing tons of those, tons of little ruby octopus. And uh, yeah, so it's been a, a macro heaven the, the last couple months here. That's it held out. I can see the look in his eyes. <laughs> well, because also I have, a, I have another friend who lives in Nanaimo. Maybe you know him. You know Colin uh, Hansen? Yes, 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 yes. Getting salty? So, yes. So I've been talking with him a lot. and he has a knack for finding giant Pacific octopus out and about, and I can't find one period. So I've seen exactly one on like nine Pacific Northwest trips and it was wedged up deep under a rock. And he sent me, I don't know, six of them out and about in the last two weeks, just big beefy ones out on the crawl. So between, yeah. between this and those and the lumpies, I'm, yeah, I'm suffering a little bit over here. No, it's been it's been a wonderful time to be here. And then we have the uh, the herring spawn coming up, which is going to kill the visibility. But it's a cool event to have the herring spawn and all the predators eating on them and eating the eggs. And, and so it, there's always something cool around here. I, I really love this island. One of my favorite places in the world. We've got you on here, though, to talk about warmer places and to take us away to the Bahamas so we can hear about a project which I think very few photographers get to be involved in kind of right from the start all the way through telling that story to seeing real change come from that story. And we just felt it was a fantastic thing to feature on the show because I think a lot of us have those ambitions, but rarely put the legwork in um, to make the difference really happen. And I think we're really keen to hear about the the project you were involved in the, in the Bahamas, both your book, but but more specifically the Seahorse um, Sanctuary that's that's been created in the last few months. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, to tell you guys about it. So I'm going to share my screen now and tell you a little bit about um, about the Seahorse National Park. You're seeing the, the picture come through? Yes, we are. Awesome. So to back up a little bit, um, 
I moved to the Bahamas from Canada in 2012 and lived there for almost 10 years. And after about a year of being there and starting to explore this this uh, new area to me, um, Eleuthera, some scientists told me about, um, they said, have you heard about the seahorse pond? And I said, no, but that sounds very interesting. Um, went and checked it out, snorkeled around, and in two, three feet of water, snorkeling around for an hour, I saw dozens of seahorses. And for perspective, out in the open ocean, um, at working as a dive instructor in the water all the time, over almost 10 years, I saw three seahorses outside of this pond. And you can go in here and see dozens. So it's really quite a special place. Um, hmm. Again, all snorkeling because it's so shallow. Um, and at the time, this is back in like 2013, um, basic questions about the pond weren't known. Like, is this one species of seahorse? Is it two species? Is it a hybrid species? Because they look a little bit different from the ones we find in the ocean. Yeah. Um, and But very little was known about it. Of course, the locals had known about it forever. But um, in terms of science and conservation, it was, it was basically unknown. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the pond itself. So this is it. You can see Eleuthera is a very skinny, narrow little island. And then there's um, ponds all along it. There's almost 200 inland ponds on Eleuthera. And as you can see, it's completely closed off from the main ocean. Um, now, a little bit of water does come in and out because the, the rock is very spongy. So there's tiny little tunnels and stuff. And sometimes you can see little vortexes of water getting sucked out or, or little boiling points where water is flowing in. Um, but we're pretty sure that no animals are going in and out. So that creates a unique environment. There are no large predators in this pond. And so animals evolve differently. And, you know, we're not sure how long it's been cut off from the main ocean, but probably tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years. So it's a lot of time for animals to change from how they are in the main ocean. Um, and quick. it's not just seahorses that are in there. Oh, sorry. Did you have a question? Uh, well, is that the only pond on the island that has the seahorses in them? Yes. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. So other other ponds and blue holes have, have different life that has flourished in there you know it's it's tends to be not very diverse but very um dense mm -hmm. um so yeah and it's it's not only seahorses that are in the pond there's these huge channel clinging crabs and octopus are absolutely prolific in there this is a, a caribbean reef octopus that they we we haven't studied them as much as the seahorses, but we think that they are also starting to evolve away and are slightly different from the Caribbean reef octopuses that are outside of the pond. And one thing for underwater photographers and and that I find really cool about this pond is that you can follow an octopus at night with your torch, watch it hunt, guilt free. So in the open ocean, if you follow an octopus, you know that there's a chance a big snapper, grouper, shark, something is hunting by your light and is going to kill that octopus and eat it. And we always feel a, a little bit guilty when that happens. So I always try to avoid doing that. But in the pond, there are no big predators. Um, this octopus is probably the, the top predator in that pond. Um, as you can see, the seahorses are extremely well camouflaged. So a lot of people... I've taken, you know, close friends and family in there. And, uh, you know, at first they're not seeing seahorses. They're like, what seahorses? Uh, but you point out the first couple to them and, and then they start to see them. Um, but from a science perspective, you can see how difficult they would be to count if you were just going around trying to spot uh, and count them. But I met up with um, Dr. Heather Mason. She's from um, the University of Tampa in Florida. And she started studying the seahorses in the pond and studying the pond. And one of her main goals was to A, find out what species they are, and B, how many seahorses are in the pond. And one way to count them, um, which I thought was fairly ingenious, was to inject a dye between the exoskeleton and the skin that covers the exoskeleton um, that can only be seen under black light. So it's very delicate work very difficult, very time consuming. It took a lot of um, a lot of time and effort to um, tag enough seahorses to be able to estimate the population. 
Um, but you know, you also don't want to give away the seahorse's camouflage. So I thought it was really cool that you could only see it uh, in black light, which meant a lot of night work. Um, so at the end of all this, um, she found that she estimates that there are about 800,000 seahorses in a pond that is, you know, maybe wow. two, two kilometers long by a half a kilometer wide. Uh, wow. And it is just a single species. It is uh, a lined seahorse, Hippocampus erectus. And, um, but they are morphologically distinct. So they have, I think, a couple extra vertebrae and a, and a longer snout. Um, they, they look slightly different. Um, so the science um, was the first part of turning this into a park. You need solid science. The second part then is community outreach. So that's Dr. Heather Mason. She spent a lot of time going around to different schools in the area and having town hall meetings and really working with the with the local community to um, a lot of them didn't even know that this existed um, or how unique in the world it is. I mean, they'll, they'll go swimming in there as kids, but they don't realize, hey, this is like, there's nothing else like this in the whole world. Uh, and, and you should have a lot of pride in that. And, and, and they did and they do. And as you can see, some of my images are on the board and I was, I was very happy to be able to assist with my photos in the community outreach part, a little bit the science part, um, and and whatever whatever they needed the images for, um, I was happy to to help out. Um, yeah, so the the photo opportunities in there are are great, but also very difficult because the background can be very bland. So you had to play around with with all different kinds of angles and lighting and 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 everything to make them to make them look decent. Um, but with with you know with my pictures and moreover, much more importantly, with the science of Dr. Heather Mason and and all the different conservation organizations in the Bahamas came together, organizations like Brief, the Bahamas Reef Environmental and Educational Foundation, the Bahamas National Trust, uh, Leon Levy Plant Preserve, so many others came together to uh, lobby the government to have this included in their push to have twenty percent of Bahamas ocean protected by 2020. They were a bit late, partially because of the pandemic and, and for other reasons. Uh, but this is at the, you know, the inauguration celebration. Uh, I'm very happy to have my my images displayed there as well. Um, but yeah, it was it was officially declared uh, a Seahorse National Park in the last year and they had their their big celebration here just in January of 2024. So it is a fairly new park. Um, another part of it was, you know, trying to hit the high up officials in government. So this is um, Kajarina. She is the executive director of Brief, who I partnered with to publish my book, Bahamas Underwater. And, and um, she presented that to um, upper government uh, in the Bahamas. And there's a chapter in my book about the pond and all the ponds on Eleuthera which I don't know if it played any played any part or helped at all, but, um, but we tried everything that we could. And I wanted to go back to this picture for a second because, you know, this wasn't just, hey, this is a cool spot. It deserves protection, but, there, you, you know, there's no threats. Um, there are there were threats to to the pond. So if you can see in the background here, there there is another little what looks like a pond. You can see there are boats in it. And it might be hard to see if you're watching on your phone, but um, what they did there is they dynamited out the the little barrier between the pond and the open ocean to turn it into a marina. Um, and this is before we knew what was in there. There may have been some other crazy cool uh, species living in there, uh, but we'll never know. And there was a proposal to do the same with Sweeting Pond, to uh, dynamite out this, um, this barrier and turn it into a marina. Another threat, if you see over here on the on the left hand side, there's a little uh, building there that's actually a farmhouse. And they're organic farmers, they're very much conservation minded, happy to work with us and and not and, and make sure that they're not polluting. But there were other farm proposals that may have used pesticides and fertilizers and things that would have uh, leached into the pond. And so those are the big catastrophic threats. Um, that it's now protected from. There were other smaller threats. For example, um, a couple of years ago, somebody went in and collected 100 seahorses for the aquarium trade. 
Um, so there were there were very very much threats to the pond. So it's, it it was you know a huge victory to uh, to get it fully protected. Um, and this was this was my favorite image that I made in there. Um, it sort of became the poster child for the pond and represented to me the the density of life that is in there. Um, and is one of my just all time favorite shots as well. And uh, Alex will remember it won the macro category of underwater photographer of the year that year. And um, yeah, so it's a very special place to me personally and and professionally. And it's a big win for conservation. And I'm happy to have played uh, a tiny role in it. And well, thank I, you, thanks for listening. Well, it's absolutely fantastic and a a wonderful wonderful story and a fantastic success. I mean, I think. These days, we tend to often associate conservation and the ocean about stories about problems, and it's great to hear a you know predominantly positive story, talking about you know protecting an area of everyone you know getting all the stakeholders fully on board and really making a difference. It's wonderful to see this picture again. <laughs> um, I will be seeing it again later this week because um, we have the Underwater Photographer of the Year Awards in London uh, on Friday night uh, as we're recording this. And um, as part of that, because it's our 10 year anniversary of, of the modern UPY, I've got a slideshow of our favorite pictures from the 10 years. And um, I'm not giving too much away by saying this one is, is in there in the, in the, in the best of um, bid as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's lovely to see that again. I'm gonna put us all back on full screen for a sec. So yeah, there we go. Um, so we can catch up. I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, yeah. One is a biological one, which I don't expect you necessarily to know the answer to. And that is, is I'm very interested in in kind of the, the life cycle of the seahorses. Seahorses obviously give birth to, to live young, um, which are kind of miniature versions of the adults, which is quite unusual in, in ocean fish, um, which usually have a larval stage. But those mini seahorses do tend to drift off in the plankton. So the seahorses must have, it will be interesting to know if their larval stage has shortened because they're in a pond, if actually mm -hmm. it's become almost a benthic larval stage because it might be safer for the youngsters to be in amongst the, the weeds than floating in open ocean. And I, I just think that would be a really interesting research question in terms of understanding about the lion seahorses in there. But the, yeah. I, I think the question that a lot of people will be going is, can I go there? Can I visit? What are the rules, um, you know, restrictions, plus opportunities of going there as a photographer. Yeah, absolutely. So um, sustainable ecotourism is is a big part of the management of the pond. Um, they do want people to go in there and enjoy it. Um, and, you know, to back up for a second, when when I first stumbled across the pond and was talking with with Dr. Heather Mason and, and others, the, the strategy at the time was let's keep it secret. Because if word starts to get out too much, you know, the wrong people find out they, they might. So, but then we started noticing that tourists were finding it anyway via TripAdvisor. And we thought, well, if they're finding it anyway, then maybe we need to change strategies from just keeping it a secret to actually protecting it. And in order to protect it, you have to do the opposite of keeping it a secret. You have to really get it out there and get it well known. Um, but it was an interesting, you know, sort of ethical debate that we had around that. Um so sorry, I digressed, but I wanted to mention that. Yeah. Um, so what are the rules now? It's still being worked out. Um, I know what some of the recommendations are going forward, but I don't know exactly how it's going to be implemented. It's still it's still fairly new. I know what I would like to see are, you know, maybe a closed off area that wouldn't be available to to swimmers, snorkelers. Um, obviously, no walking. Um, if you're not a good swimmer, wear a flotation device. You know, probably best to not hose yourself down with mosquito repellent and sunscreen right before you get into the water. Um, things like that. Uh, you know, if it becomes a big tourist attraction and large number of people go there, then you need to think about you know sanitation and proper bathrooms and 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 those types of things. Um, but at this point, um, as far as I know, there's no there's no restrictions. Um, we can go there and and enjoy it and you know hopefully 
be responsible, but the Bahamas National Trust BNT will be implementing um, protocols and rules and and those sorts of things um, as it goes on. Well, that's great to hear. Did they do genetic testing on those seahorses to determine that they are lions? Because they look very different than the ocean dwelling lion seahorses. And I'm surprised if they've been in there that long that they haven't diverged enough to be their own thing. Yeah, yeah. No, when um it wasn't that long ago when when Heather was going around giving a talk called One Species, Two Species, Hybrid Species, because we really didn't know. Um, but yeah, the genetic testing did reveal that they're all lined seahorses, Hippocampus erectus, uh, but are morphologically distinct, but not they're not um, genetically. genetically their own species. Cool. And, and it would make sense that that pond's probably only existed post Ice Age because it would have probably drained out through that porous rock during the ice yeah. with the lower sea level. So you're probably talking, you know, eight, 10,000 years old, which, you know, is time for, for divergence, but probably the level that you see is that the seahorses are probably early colonizers when the water was, was, you know, when the, the, you know, the area stabilized. Um, yeah. I think we should wrap that up at about that point. Um, I'd very much hope you'll come back on the show sometime. Um, Shane, because you have done so much interesting photography. I think, you know, we were saying in our introduction to you that um, just about every picture you take is worth seeing because you really try to, you're, you know, we say you're a very thoughtful photographer. You try to create images that talk about big issues, that talk about interesting creatures, and you try and create images that also have that graphic power to them to really engage with audiences. Um, so you're a very, very interesting photographer to follow. So maybe the final thing you can tell us is where can people find you and find your work? Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Alex. That that really means a lot coming from you, and it it is what I'm striving for. And and so uh, so thanks again. Uh, my website shanegross.com, Instagram at shanegrossphoto, uh, and you can buy my book Bahamas Underwater from my website at shanegross.com. And thanks again for having me. This is a thrill. And yes, I will absolutely come back anytime you guys want. Right Brilliant. On. Well, thanks for being our first guest on the Underwater Photography Show. Yeah, Thank for sticking you. with us through those trials and tribulations of being number one. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>